Hello, welcome back to uh, Engineering 211 Statics, and I wanted to pick up where we left off last time working on uh, frames and uh, machines. So uh, we'll get right at it then. I'd like to uh, look at this problem. If you've uh, driven past uh, parts of the oil producing country and whatnot, you've no doubt uh, seen things like this, uh, oil pumps at work, where you have the, uh, the, the walking beam here that's going to uh, tip and the uh, uh, wire rope or the uh, pump rod coming down here and it's uh, then lifting this up each time it lifts a small column of oil and brings that up um, to be used for whatever. Um, what's causing this to then rock back and forth is this mechanism over here. You have the uh, tie rod, nice two-force member there between A and D. You have the uh, counterweight here of, of 2,000 pounds on this arm, and then you've got the uh, motor housing. There's a motor and a uh, gear reduction in there. A lot of times they use some old gasoline engines, actually use some of the gases off the uh, top of the well to run this, or they might be electric or something like that. So a variety of uh, interesting ways uh, to, to run these things. They've been around for a long time. A lot of them have been uh, running continuously for years and years and years. So we've got our uh, dimensions here. This uh, walking beam itself is uh, 1,300 pounds. Pounds. This uh, horse head up here that the cable wraps around is um, 600 pounds, and the, and the reason for that is so it has a geometry, so it's always pulling straight up on this this wire because you don't want to break it down there somewhere in the well. Uh, we're saying that the uh, um, shaft or cable down into the well and the uh, column of oil is 2,500 pounds. Depending on how deep the well is, that may or may not be a good number and this uh, head itself is 600 pounds. And what we'd like to do is we'd like to come up with the torque, this uh, moment, the torque, that the motor has got to uh, exert on this thing. Well, uh, I mentioned that this uh, AD was a two-force member. That's the only two-force member that we see, so it's obviously not a truss. And then we ask the question, is it a frame, or I'm sorry, it's a uh, certainly not a truss, so it is a frame and a machine. And then we have to ask the question, is it rigid or non-rigid? So if we were to remove uh, this, if we were to take a torch and cut this off and that off and then uh, this off, I, I think we'd recognize that it is non-rigid. Okay, so it's non-rigid. So we're not going to be able to get the reactions necessarily. I mean, this would be... Um, three unknowns here because it's a fixed reaction, three unknowns there, a fixed reaction, three unknowns there, a fixed reaction, all kinds of statically indeterminate problems if we try and do the reactions. So we're going to have to go to the individual uh, members. So with that, let me draw a um, picture of the um, walking beam up here and see what we've got. So we'll start out like this. Okay, so we've got something like that, and we can start to put the uh, forces on here. We have this at 2,500 pounds. We have um, 600 pounds here. I have then at uh, a pin connection at B, so I could say that this is uh, BY, and maybe I'll say that this is BX, and we have uh, 1,300 pounds there. And then over here at A, uh, this is a two-force member, so let me just put that force going down that member. We could say that that was uh, AD, and that's at an angle of uh, 70 degrees with respect to the horizontal. We're going to take this thing at the horizontal, and that brings up a good point. Uh, if we were to fully analyze this, we'd want to look at it through its complete range of motion. We're just looking at uh, one, one point or one snapshot in time. Well, we've, we've taken care of this point here, we've taken care of the point B, we've got this uh, weight, we've got that weight, and we've got the uh, uh, well well rod uh, taken care of. So I think we are uh, good. I'll refer back to this picture here for the dimensions. And let's get a look at a general scheme here. If I could figure out the force in this uh, two-force member AD, then I could transfer that to this piece here and hopefully come up with a moment. So I think AD is really what I'm looking for at, at this point. Well, I'm not interested in B. Um, maybe someone else is, but I'm not interested in B. So I think summing the moment about B is probably a pretty good choice. Got a uh, errant uh, dot here. So if I uh, sum the uh, moment at B, setting that equal to zero, I don't have to worry about BY. 
and I don't know BY, I don't have to worry about BX, I don't know BX, I actually don't even have to worry about this, although I know it, so it's not a big deal, uh, but I get to ignore those three, and that's kind of nice. So with that, I could say that I have, what, 600 times uh, that distance there, which is going to be 6, plus uh, 2,500 times the distance of 6 plus 1, this 6 plus that 1, so I'd have 7, that comes from 6 plus 1. And so I've taken care of this one, I've taken care of this one. And what do I have left here? I have this piece. Well, I could break this up into a piece like uh, horizontal and a piece vertical. The horizontal piece actually intersects. So again, B is a really good choice here. So all I have to do is worry about the vertical piece. So I'm going to subtract off because it's going to rotate. It looks like I was taking clockwise as positive, doesn't it? So I'll have to subtract off. AD times the sine of 70 times the distance that that acts through, which is what, 5? So I could solve for AD then and say that AD was equal to uh, 6 uh, times 600 plus 7 times 2,500 divided by 5 times the sine of 70. I think that turns out to be about 4490 pounds. Let me double check that here so we don't propagate a mistake through the problem. Yeah, 4490.8, 4491. Uh, remember, we're, we're pumping oil here. The, the, the temperature and the viscosity of the oil probably has a lot more effect on this than if we were to round this off. So I think I'm just going to take that uh, this is equal to, why don't I say, uh, 4,500 pounds is a pretty nice round number for us. Okay, so 4,500 pounds, and I will uh, stay with that. So that's what we have in here. That allows me to move to this portion, right? So with that, I think I'll go to the next page. And draw a free body diagram of this, uh, this hammer here that's going around. That would uh, look something like this. So you get this hammer here, and this uh, this would be on a shaft here, so it'd have a support here and a support here. I'm not even sure what that point is. So I don't necessarily know what to call it, but um, those those would be unknowns. I've got some moment here. That's what I'm looking for. We'll just call that M. And then I have this force back here. That's what we just found at 4,500, right? 4,500 pounds. And I'm told that I have 2,000 pounds acting. This is a weight, so it's going to be acting to the center of the Earth, isn't it? So I have 2,000 pounds. Okay. They usually have fairly large counterweights on these. They're heavy machines. They're uh, built to exert uh, large forces, although that's not a particularly large force, but also to, to operate um, <clears throat> nonstop uh, for years at a time. Let's see. The uh, couple other things that we need to notice is 20 degrees. That's uh, effectively this angle here, isn't it? Okay, so if I were to uh, sum the moments about that point there, summing the moments about that point there, setting it equal to zero, I'll have to go ahead and take clockwise as positive, and I have uh, what? M, that's M, and then I'm going to have to subtract off 4,500 times what distance? Three. And then I need to add to this, and if I look at this, I could break it up in a piece that was like this and a piece that is like that, right? So if I look at this angle in here, what's this angle in here? That's actually the same. That's going to be that same 20 degrees, isn't it? And this component here actually intersects that point. So really all I have to do is worry about uh, 2,000 
times the cosine of 20. So that gives me this piece here. And that's acting through a distance, this total distance, which would be 3 plus uh, 2.5. So that's 5. 3 plus 2.5. Whoops, that doesn't work. That'd be 5.5, wouldn't it? Okay, so we have 5.5. Good. So I could solve then for m, and no matter where we, again, no matter where we sum the moments about, had I summed the moments about here, had I summed the moments about here, had I summed it about some point off of there, I would have had to have included that moment. That's a free vector. Okay, so we can say that uh, m is going to be equal to, let's see, we move this to the other side, 4,500 times 3 minus 2,000 times the uh, cosine of 20 times 5.5. That's not a very good 5. Five point five, and you can see this. Uh, this is a, a counterweight, and you can see how this uh, number is used to reduce the moment. So that counterweight is actually working; it's helping us. That's what counterweights are supposed to do. So we go through the math there. We should come up with uh, thirty-one sixty-three uh, pound feet. Let me double check that. Three thousand one hundred sixty-three. Yeah. Okay. So we'll go ahead and say that the uh, moment would be equal to three thousand one hundred sixty pound feet, and it's a positive number, so we know it's going in the clockwise direction. So it doesn't appear that we were asked for the uh, direction. The direction is given there. I mean, if we put the uh, moment over that then we would need the direction. So reasonable significant figures, units, and a direction should be good to go. 3,160 pound feet. What's it going to take to uh, to do something like that? Uh, that's quite a bit of torque. I mean if we look at a uh, um, most diesel engines that you might put in a, a highway truck or something like that are not going to produce that kind of a, a, a torque. Um, so what are you going to do? You're probably going to use a much smaller engine, but you're going to use some significant gear reduction because it, it depends on what um, what the rotational rate is. So you could probably get away with a much smaller engine or even a gas engine, but you're going to use a gearbox because if you look at the revolution here, it's probably not um, a thousand or two thousand or three thousand. This would be r really uh, zipping along. It's maybe a uh, half of um, Maybe it's uh, two or three revolutions per minute or something like that. So uh, a very slow rate, so it's probably got a significant gear reduction, and, and that's how it can have that torque a little bit uh, like a, a transformer, like we talked about in electrical. As we reduce the RPMs with a gear box, we're going to increase the torque. Conversely, if we uh, decrease, uh, if we want to... Uh, increase the RPMs, we will decrease the, the torque. And we're going to talk a lot about that in uh, dynamics as, as we go uh, through this and talk about how no one really measures, well, no one, certainly no one does measure horsepower, they measure torque and they measure RPM. So that'll be a good discussion in the, uh, in the future. But uh, suffice to say, this pretty good size number would take a, uh, um, a good gearbox to, to produce that. Well, I think we've got that one handled. Let's move on to another problem. I've got three problems today, and uh, I want to tackle this. This is a typical uh, bolt cutter or a compound uh, cutter where you might have some sort of a uh, cutting jaws here, and it would have something uh, between those. Maybe you're cutting a bolt or a lock or something like that. I used to, uh, when I'd lecture about this, bring a pair of bolt cutters in, pass them around. A little harder to do with a format like this. but um, this uh, I, I think if you you know you could uh, do a quick Google search for bolt cutters and you'll see a an actual uh, picture. Uh, but these are about the dimensions that you'd have for a, a small pair of bolt cutters. Uh, what would be about 20, uh, 20 inches, 24 inch uh, long bolt cutter, something like that uh, that you might use to cut off small locks or uh, uh, small bolts or something like that. 
and um, what we would like to do is if we have and I've they got this messed up a little bit. We'd like to find the force at the jaw. So we're, we're looking for what's going on at the uh, jaw there. And we're going to say that we put a hundred pounds into this. So we're going to say that this is a hundred pounds. And we're going to say that this is a hundred pounds. And that's going to be um, something certainly to, to talk about. Well, uh, I'd like to, to, to start the analysis of this. And to do that, I'm really just going to look at one side of this. I'm going to just uh, essentially cut this down the middle and look at one side of this and maybe look at the uh, the first jaw. This would be the uh, first uh, lever and this would be the uh, second lever. So if I look at this first lever, I'm going to have something that looks like this. And I'll say that, uh, we'll just go ahead and say that there's that crushing force in there. We're going to say that that's equal to J. And then I probably have essentially uh, some roller support here. Okay. And we're always fairly liberal with our roller supports here in terms of uh, if, if you want to think about putting a uh, roller over here, you, you can because that's it's going to move that way. Usually when we put a roller like that, we'll think that that roller would take uh, tension or compression. And then I have a pinned connection here. So I'm going to put this and I'm going to call this R1. You might say, well, it's a pin. Shouldn't you have a uh, force in the horizontal? Uh, well, we'd know that that would be equal to zero from these other forces uh, here. Because this is usually a strap that's uh, fairly free to, uh, to rotate like this. Uh, so, so you've got uh, something like this. And uh, given the uh, distances here, if I were to sum the moment about that uh, center point, setting that equal to zero, we could conclude that J times a distance of a half up here is equal to R1 times a distance of three. Okay. Now some people may, uh, well, let me, let me finish this uh, thought here. What is, um, I need to solve this for J, don't I? Yeah, I think I'm going to say that uh, J is equal to, if I multiply both sides by 2, I get R1 times 6, right? Multiplying both sides by 2. So I'll stop momentarily with that and come back and talk. This is probably uh, concerned some people the way we've done that. We've just looked at, at one side, and the question always comes up, is our force 100 or is our force 200? And I would like to take an aside with that. And this is probably one of the, this is one of those important moments in statics that you should probably have a handle on. So we're going to go back to way back in history. It seems like we've made a, a, a terrible transition here. Maybe I've edited the videos wrong or something. Uh, but uh, stay with me for a while. So we go back in uh, history uh, and the um, Mogdenberg Hemisphere Experiment. You've, you've actually probably seen this. Um, this gentleman, von Goerich took two hemispheres, two half spheres, and he, he put them together. And he wanted to show that a vacuum exists, so he put a, a vacuum in there. And a little bit of uh, the, the history, this happened in Magdeburg, Germany. He developed the uh, vacuum pump in 1641, and he did his classic hemisphere experiment in 1654. So he had uh, two-foot diameter spheres, and he had two teams of eight horses. So he had a team of horses uh, pulling here. Okay, so... Got a harness here and some uh, horses. And I'm not going to draw two teams of eight horses. I'm just going to have one horse, but my horse always turns into a llama. Uh, so I've got a, a team of horses here, or team of llamas there, and a team of uh, horses or, or llamas here. Okay, trying uh, desperately to pull those apart. And uh, so I guess maybe I would need to say um, times eight times eight. So you get you get the picture. Multiply by this by eight and change the llamas to horses and you got what's going on here. Now you, when I say you've probably seen this, you obviously weren't around for this experiment, but you've seen this. Maybe uh, I think uh, Levi's uses this on their uh, their jeans. They want to show that their jeans are so tough. Um, they have the horse is trying to pull the jeans apart. 
All right, you got the uh, jeans there with the pockets and whatnot. So Levi's uses this. If you look at their label, it's actually a spoof on the Mogdenberg Hemisphere experiment. Well, anyway, whether you're trying to pull this um, set of, uh, this um, pair of jeans apart or whether you're trying to pull this um, sphere apart, the question is, what force is pulling this apart? Okay. Is it one team? Or is it two teams? Is it um, unknown? Or oh, we could go on. D might be. How did we get on this subject? But uh, bear with me. I think it's. I think it's important. Well, well, Martin, or, uh, von Goerich, he was quite a showman. I mean, it, this was back in the day where you, when you were showing it in front of the emperor. Uh, if it didn't work out, you, 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 life could get really ugly for you. So he wanted this to be a nice show. But if he was on a bit more of a budget, could he have got the same effect by attaching this side to a tree or a, a stump? And when you think about it that way, he absolutely could have. Instead of he could have got, you know, sent these horses off to do something else and attached this one end to a fixed object, a tree, a stump, a big boulder, or something like that, and he would have had exactly the same force in this. So with that, it's very easy to see that it's one team. Whatever one, whatever the essentially the weakest team, whatever the weakest team can exert. That's what the force is there. That would be true for the uh, the genes also. So a lot of people struggle with this when you when you give something and you put these two forces on here. Uh, they try and double those forces. They're unsure what the answer is. Go back and think about the uh, Mogdenberg experiment, and I'll definitely make sure this ends up in the, the the PDFs. So when we go back to this one, that makes it so it's a little bit easier to think about separating this and just looking at one side of this. Because um, I, I, I don't know that there's many people that could grab this bolt cutter and try and exert 100 pounds. Put one hand here and one hand here and exert 100 pounds. You'd have to be have some pretty good uh, uh, chest muscles and whatnot, arm muscles, to be able to do that. But I think most people could facilitate this because what, what would they do? They would just go ahead and put this side on the ground and then press down on this and put all of their weight on there. So in that regard, that hopefully, hopefully makes sense. So we've got this relationship. Let's go ahead and look at this uh, second lever here like this. And again, I'm going to put the uh, roller here. And if R1 is up there, this point and this point, it would have to be equal and opposite, right? That's uh, good old Newton's third law. So I'm going to say that I have R1 there. And then I have this uh, F, which is equal to that 100 pounds. Kind of made a hash of that. Oh, that's not got better. There we go. 100 pounds. So if I sum uh, the moment about this point setting it equal to zero what do I have I have R1 times the distance of 1 is going to be equal to F times the distance of 16 so if I solve for R1 here I could say that that's equal to F times what 16 over 1 so over here I make that substitution I'm going to substitute that in and I could say that J, the crushing force at the jaws, is going to be equal to F times 16 over 1 times 6, which would be F times, what's uh, 6 times 16? Is that 96? Let me double check that just so I don't have to go back and edit the video. Yep, 96. Good. So then when I put the 100 in there, I could say that J is equal to 9,600 pounds. So that's the crushing force. And presumably if those uh, jaws are reasonably sharp, it could uh, shear through those. We're going to talk a lot more about that spring term and strengths of materials, whether that would shear through a quarter inch shaft or a 3 16th shaft or um, what, what that would do. So uh, that's our result with 100 pounds here. 
we end up with 9,600 pounds here. And again, uh, what's that look like on that uh, shaft? You could either think of it like this with that force J like this, or if you wanted to, you could think of J there and J there. Okay, so 9,600 uh, uh, pounds. That seems too good to be true. For 100 pounds out here, I have a mechanical advantage of 96. That's a big mechanical advantage, and these have a tremendous mechanical advantage. What's the downside to this? Well, it's the range of motion. You're going to have to push this 100 pounds for a long ways to get a very small range of motion there, but usually you end up kind of uh, just pinching this off. The, the uh, jaws don't go very far through that, and then it uh, snaps it off. So usually uh, works. Anyway... Um, I guess if you want, you know, you could uh, borrow someone's bolt cutters and, and play with them. Uh, sometimes when you go down to the store, you can use bolt cutters. If you buy chain or something, they have some bolt cutters there that you could use. So you go down and buy like two inches of chain just so that you can uh, play with the bolt cutters. Uh, that would be a uh, fun thing to do on an afternoon. So anyway, don't say I sent you. Well, the, uh, the last problem that I want to tackle, this actually is one that, that I did. Um, I think this is a lecture problem when I was in uh, school. It's kind of kind of a silly problem, but it, it's it's a useful problem and, and a good problem as we uh, finish up our our work in here. Our, our work, at least with uh, frames and machines, and I'll, we'll we'll talk about it in in that regard. So. We have a scenario where a, a poor college student apparently has a, a scale, but it only has a 100-pound uh, maximum rating, so it can't weigh anything more than 100 pounds on it. And it's got a little spring scale like you might have in a fishing box or something to, to weigh. a uh, You can hang something on it. And it's uh, 20 pounds maximum. Okay, So this is 100 pounds maximum. This is 20 pounds maximum. So the student comes up with a system. Uh, that if the student stands on the scale and has some sort of a uh, belt here and this uh, cable coming up to this pulley system that um, when he or she exerts 19 pounds of their, their hands they're going to pull down on this and this scale reads 19 pounds that this scale reads 67 pounds so 19 is less than 20 so we haven't, haven't uh, maxed out this uh, spring scale and 67 obviously is less than 100, so we haven't maxed out this spring scale. So what we'd like to do is we'd like to find the weight of the student. Um, or person, I guess they wouldn't necessarily need to be a student. Anyway, kind of a, kind of a silly problem, but I think an important problem, because what it really shows is the tool that we use, and that's the free body diagram. So let me uh, draw a picture of this uh, person. Okay, so we're going to have some, some forces on this. Oh, we've got to always have a head and a, and a hat. Okay, so we've got some tension up here. We're going to have to find that. And we have here, we're told this is 19 pounds, right? And then we have the weight of the person. And then I have, what's the uh, scale? It's pushing up at 67 pounds, isn't it? So have I got everything? I mean, if I were to uh, cut through here, we've got the scale at 19 pounds. We've got some tension here in this, uh, uh, go this uh, cord going to the uh, belt or harness or something. We've got the uh, weight acting. The weight, that's what we're really looking for. This is really what we want. And we, of course, have the scale pushing up. The, the, the student would be pushing down on the scale with 67 pounds by Newton's third law. The scale's pushing up on them also with 67 pounds. So that's what we've got. Well, I've got to figure out what this tension is. So let me look at this. If we look at this, this pulley just changes the direction. And I'm going to ignore any small angularity in here. So really what I have is with, with this... If I look at this pulley here and that pulley there, and this rig that I have, I could say that uh, if this is 19 pounds, this would be 19, and wouldn't that be 19? Yeah, that'd be 19 pounds. And if if the, if we have 19 pounds there. I would have 19 there, wouldn't I? 
and this probably just changes the direction. So I would have 19 here, and then I would have 19 there. And we've gone through pulley analysis several times that if it's the same uh, diameter or, or same radius on each side, it, it, the, it, the forces are going to be equal to equal to each other. So I'll leave that. So we've got 19, 19, 19, and 19. That's from up here, right there, 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 and there. And that all has to be equal to this T that we have there, right? Okay. So if I sum the forces in the vertical direction, setting that equal to zero, I have uh, 4 times 19 minus T is equal to zero. So T turns out to be what? 76, is that right? 76 pounds? Like so. Double check that. Yep, 76 pounds. Okay, so now if I take this and put that up there, seventy-six pounds. And this was this was a, again a, a good problem to finish up with um, because we we drew a free body diagram here, and I had too many unknowns. Two unknowns. You might say, well, you had uh, three equations, but now they're they're all. Uh, Parallel forces, right? They're all actually we're, we're thinking of them almost uh, collinear. Uh, so I really only had uh, some of the forces in the vertical, right? Um, so I had too many unknowns. I had to go draw another free body diagram somewhere else and then come back. So I had the uh, the patience and the discipline to go draw another another free body diagram and then come back. So now. I can sum the forces in the vertical direction on this one, setting it equal to zero. And what do I have? I have uh, 67 plus 19 plus 76 minus W, right? So I could say that W is equal to 67 plus 19 plus 76, which gives me, what, 162? Is that right? Yes, 162. So that's the weight of the uh, student. And uh, obviously they couldn't measure that on a scale that was uh, 100 pounds maximum. So this is not a, a probably a solution that you're going to, I mean, obviously, in, uh, in uh, practical matters, you just go buy yourself a, a proper scale. But the, the value of this problem is learning that we have a tool. Uh, and, and I don't want to call it a trick because that cheapens it, uh, but you, you've heard of problems maybe where you've got one train coming from New York to Chicago and another train going from Chicago to New York, and there's a, a carrier pigeon released from one to the other and so forth, and there's usually a trick to solve those problems. And there's a trick to solve this, and I'll use that cheap term, but the trick is a free body diagram. So as you go through these problems make sure that you're drawing free body diagrams make sure that you're using the free body diagrams when you come up with too many unknowns in your free body diagram take the time to go draw another free body diagram to come up with one of those unknowns and then come back so yeah this is a kind of a silly problem a stupid scenario but it's a good way to finish up and and realize what we've learned i think uh, that this i think you'd agree this is a fairly simple problem uh, but had we looked at this the first day of class, I'm not sure many people uh, probably could have got it. Uh, and if they did, uh, laid it out in a logical fashion. So um, you've come a long ways. And keep using these uh, tools, uh, the free body diagram. It's a powerful tool. Well, I think that gets us to our uh, stopping point for the day and for the section. When we get together next time, we're going to go back and look at the end of Chapter 4. We skipped around a little bit and looked at uh, distributed loads, and that uh, will be important as we then move on to internal forces. So uh, take care till then, and thank you for watching.